Is that? Okay, so regular Bible study, if you're part of Carol's Bible study, this Thursday from 3 o'clock to 6, so an hour earlier. Oh, 3 to whenever. Oh, 3 to whenever. Excellent. Uh, so, but starting at 3 at Carol's, barbecue, um, awesome. Okay. And then this Saturday, um, we have both men's breakfast and a work party. So men's breakfast, 8 o'clock, work party starting at 10. And as many people as we can get going for that, that would be wonderful. Um, anything you want to add to that, Sean? Nope. Nope. Deacons, any deacon add additions to the work party or anything? Yes? Yes, actually. I need to sign it. All right. Who knows what this is? Um, I got a sign up sheet. We've got uh, several things lined up for Saturday to work on. What are you doing? What are you doing? We're going to have a work on <laughs> Don't tell them what it is. As I've heard, I, I've heard said a couple of times recently by some people that may be close to me but may not be. That is not a party. Oh, right. It's the hat they make you wear that makes it a party. Oh, it's not a party. Not a party. Not a party. Not a anyway, sorry to go. So we're going to have some work, work fun. Anyway, lunch is fun. Lunch is fun. Lunch is going to be great. Uh, the first page here is what we're hoping to focus on. Do as many of these as we can. If you dare turn the page, these are some things for later, or maybe you want to come some other day during the week, and that would be terrific as well. Okay, we're just hoping to kind of wrap up the, the season in a in a bang and get as many things done as we can, just to just to spruce it up, make make the also to make the church more more visible from the. The road. Somehow green things grow tall. So, George. Are you going to have music other than Jeff whistling? And then Les, 
this anniversary that you're having on Wednesday, how many years is it for you? 55. <laughs> You've been married as long as I've been alive. <laughs> now, that is impressive. Excellent. Well, let us sing happy anniversary to Les. And remind me of your wife's name. My wife's name? Yeah. yeah. yeah thank you. Let us Please stand now for the call to worship, Psalm 131. And I have to think back to your earliest years for this one. Oh Yahweh, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul. Like, like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in Yahweh. From this time forth and forevermore. I love that image. What a beautiful image that is. Uh, please join us in worship together. It's in your worship uh, bulletin. How beautiful heaven must be, and I need to pray.
struggles and temptations that entangle and draw our hearts away from you. And so we want to confess, even as we come, we, we know the beauty of who you are, and we know the beauty of your promises before us. We get um, so distracted by other things. We get so torn down by other things. We long to see the beauty of your person and the beauty of your promises afresh. And Lord, may we lift each other up here before your throne of grace, that we might all receive grace to walk forward. And as you have called us as well, to keep us from falling. Because to you belong all the honor and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you. And be with you. Let us greet one another, Lord. Good morning. Good morning. The New Testament reading this morning is Matthew 6, 25 through 33. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which oh, today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O men of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall I eat? Or what shall I drink? Or what shall I wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you have need of them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. What a wonderful word from the Lord. Uh, if I could call the children forward, um, we're going to respond to this in song. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's in your hymnals that you want to join along with. One, two, one.
support and our, and our uh, privilege to be able to support here. Um, I know they all need encouragement in various ways. Uh, we thank you for John and Jen Myers and their family as they're able to now come uh, back to the states. They're already here for a year of respite, Lord, and we pray that it will be a wonderfully rejuvenating time for them as they have invested so many years of their life in bringing the gospel to the Kaje people. And, and there is a vibrant church among that tribe that did not know you before. And so we are so very grateful for that and for you raising them up to do that work. And we pray for the church as they are gone, knowing that that church is in your care even in their absence, Lord. So help them to to know the, the, the peace of that as they are apart and for the Kaje people, the believers there, Lord, that they would strive and grow in you and, and even begin to, to take your good news and your gospel to other surrounding tribes as well, Lord. We think of um, the other Myers in the Philippines, Lord, as they are um, getting their connections and enculturation and language learning and all that sort of stuff with the young family, Lord. We pray that you would Continue to encourage them day by day as they are just walking, plodding forward in this long journey that is of being an overseas missionary, Lord. We do pray that you do your work in their lives to get them to that place with their, where, where they can confidently share your gospel and your good news there amongst those that are with them, Lord. So we pray your blessing upon their ministry. We think also of Shokrat and Maya doing their ministry from uh, from here in Long Branch via media to the Turkmen speaking peoples of the world uh, centered in Turkmenistan where they are from uh, and also uh, as he especially and they and, and together are able to journey to uh, Turkey and other places to be able to minister. Lord we pray your hand of protection to rest upon them. Um, the enemy loves his darkness and does not want to see the light intrude but Lord, you are the light of the world and you will intrude um, even as the enemy seeks to push back. So we pray you protect his life and the life of his family, the life of those who are on the ministry team. We know there's a situation technologically where they're having to make some uh, um, decisions. Lord, we pray that you would provide the means for the word to continue to go forth most effectively and abundantly Whatever that medium is, Lord, we pray you just open the door and provide the way. We just ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, I just want to thank you for uh, the ladies gathering for Bible study yesterday. It was a very precious time. Lord, I ask that you use that time to um, create solid relationships and for us to be trained and directed by your word as we go forth as women in this church. But I thank you for this morning's Bible study, Father, as um, it starts again this fall and such a wonderful foundation that was laid again this morning uh, that we can launch from. And Lord, I just, I thank you for the pastor here. I thank you for the congregation here. I thank you for what you plan to do in us and through us in this season. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, I pray for Amy, who's, who um, got sick from a barbecue yesterday. <laughs> she wasn't able to be here today, and I know that just being here is always a recharge for the week that is ahead. And, um, Lord, we need the encouragement. Mm -hmm. I pray that she recovers. Yes. Mm -hmm. Lord, I ask you to help the people of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I hope that you'll let them win. Mm -hmm. I hope the Russians go on. And I hope this doesn't turn into the biggest mess. Mm -hmm. In the name I pray. Yes. And for the Russian people as well, Lord. Um, uh, families are in both countries, really, Lord, and it's so much like civil war. Uh, just work in people's lives there. Uh, allow there to be Christians um, that would be able to be strong and uh, 
continue to, through your strength and leadership, Lord, um, get the gospel out and uh, cause there to be a great awakening um, due to the political uh, persecution, Lord, in both nations. Lord, I pray for the city of Tacoma. It was named the number one, number five most violent city right now. Mm. And just outside of where I work, there was a double homicide just a couple weeks ago, Lord. Um, the city is very lost, Lord. Please continue to bring and turn people to you, Lord, in the city of Tacoma. They need you desperately. I also pray for a co-worker's father, Al, who was just diagnosed with leukemia. Please heal him, Lord, and give him strength and um, strength. Let us, let us close together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I can call the ushers forward at this time to receive the offer.
with howling storms swirling all around us and the aftermath of those storms destructive power scattered all around us as well. Whether that's the degradation of our culture, the apostasies of the church, the geopolitical instabilities in the world, whether that's the rising tyranny and authoritarianism that we've witnessed rear its head and run amok, for example, in the COVID policies of the pandemic we've weathered, or the intensely polarized politics of our increasingly fractured system, or the unrelenting assault on our First Amendment freedoms especially, or whether parents or the state are the proper guardians and guides of our kids, or the insistence and indoctrination of pro-LGBTQ ideology. We've touched on all these things before. Mm -hmm. And it only takes open eyes instead of heads in the sand to see and feel these howling storms all around us and what carnage will be left in their wake. But why this chapter? Why these few short verses? Why these words to this man? Why such personal words from God to this particular servant of his? We're used to long and involved chapters. Long chapters, did I mention? Uh, involving many difficult and important things with huge weight and consequences attached to them, like the impending threat of judgment, of chief note, desolation. We even had personal words from God to particular people, not just through Jeremiah, but to Jeremiah on numerous occasions, but also important people like King Jehoiakim and King Zedekiah, especially and repeatedly, and even to other important people like the abusive priest, Pasha, that was chapter 20. But here it's a personal word to Jeremiah's secretary. Why include this? And why include it here? Because it's completely out of place, chronologically speaking, in the narrative flow, almost 20 years out of place. From 20 years before the events we just left off with in chapter 44. These are some of the questions we'll be addressing this morning as we work our way through the substance of these verses. But the big picture is this. Number one, it's a personal word in a pivotal time. Number two, it's a personal word to a discouraged man. A deeply disturbed and discouraged servant of God. Okay, so first, it's a personal word in a pivotal time. This is flagged by the closing words in verse 1, quote, In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, unquote. In his fourth year, Okay, what is so significant about this particular year that forms the backdrop of all that God wants to personally say to this particular man? Because this fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign, <laughs> why? That was the year the world turned. They might not have known or fully grasped its significance leading up to it or even immediately following it, but they sure found out soon enough because this year, which corresponds in our calendrical reckoning to 605 BC, was the year in which the pivotal Battle of Carchemish occurred, for any of you familiar with ancient Near Eastern history, when the balance of power, definitely and dramatically, and especially power over God's little kingdom of Judah, shifted from Egypt to Babylon. It was the event that ushered in the Neo-Babylonian Empire under the newly ascendant king Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. whom God calls my servant to chastise his own rebellious people. And notably, there are four times this fourth year is mentioned in the book of Jeremiah, including here, and each of them critical, 
We hear about the fourth year of Jehoiakim in chapter 25, verse 1. So if you have your Bibles open, we'll be flipping a few things. And if you can track with me uh, in real time, uh, all the better. Uh, in chapter 25, verse 1, it's explicitly correlated to the first year of Nebuchadnezzar. It says this, the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the people of Judah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, that was the first year of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And if you remember, that chapter was all about God's judgment through Nebuchadnezzar. First against his own people, Judah, leading to the prophecy of the 70 years of captivity, and then second, God's judgment through Nebuchadnezzar against the whole surrounding world. Like I said, it's a pivotal year. And then we next hear about this fourth year, when we get to chapter 36, when God commissions Jeremiah, oh, and it's through Baruch, to write down all his prophecies in a scroll. Chapter 36. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from Yahweh. Take a scroll and write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you, from the days of Josiah until today. Verse 4. Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll at the dictation of Jerusalem all the words of Yahweh that he had spoken to him. And if you recall, that precipitated the reading of that scroll in the temple the following year when all the people declared a national fast and for good reason. Jeremiah couldn't do it under pain of death. So he had to send Baruch scared as he was, I am sure, to do it for him. And then it was taken to the king, who meticulously cut off and burned each and every bit of the scroll as it was read to him. Cold-hearted and calculated to dismiss, disparage, and undo the word of God that warned of all the coming and just judgments of God through this newly ascendant king of Babylon, unless the people should genuinely repent. But King Jehoiakim had no interest in the word of God. And Jeremiah and Baruch had to hide for their lives and write it down all over again. That was when it would seem Judah's doom was sealed, which is perhaps why this current chapter, chapter 45, which mentions the same fourth year of Jehoiakim in verse 1, thus placing it in the early context of that chapter, chapter 36, maybe why it's placed here. Track with me as well if you have your Bibles open. Chapter 36 closed out the previous subsection, and it was already out of place. Chapter 34 had closed out dealing with the final days of Zedekiah's reign, but it was the critical moment the outright and explicit rejection of the word of God that we find in chapter 36. And so it formed an appropriate close to that moment. Well, then chapter 37 resumes where chapter 34 had left off. And the ensuing chapters brought us through the promised destruction and exile and the aftermath with the Judean leftovers ending up in Egypt. But then, in this coda, to our current subsection, we... Loop back. We come back to this same moment once again. Why? It's a narrative frame bringing us back once again to that critical moment, what happened in that pivotal year. But it's also a transition into God's judgments on the nations of the world, beginning with his judgments against Egypt at the Bing, 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 bing. Oh, Battle of Carchemish. Look with me at chapter 46, verse 2, about Egypt. Concerning the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was by the river Euphrates at Carchemish, and which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, defeated in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. That is the year the world turned. 
and turn particularly for God's people. And all that angst, the angst brood, took its toll on this faithful servant of God. And we'll look at that in a moment. But I want us to briefly touch that onto our own lives as well, because certainly, at least from my perspective in my limited lifetime and experience, this is a markedly unique moment. Mm -hmm. We too are living in pivotal times. The world certainly turned during the pandemic. The world certainly turned with the thorough infiltration and now bludgeon of the new sex and gender ideology. The world is certainly on the cusp of turning with the alarming rise of unfettered AI or with the disastrous abandonment of Afghanistan giving Russia the green light to invade Ukraine and with China cementing its dominance over the South China Sea and rattling its sabers over Taiwan, if that powder keg were to have a blow, we would not know what the world will look like after that. But it would certainly be turned. Are we in a similarly pivotal year? And, and what distresses does that bring to our psyches, our, our whole psychosomatic selves? Yes, we are men and women of faith. But we are also simply men and women, subject to struggle and frailty, Amen. and in need of God's word to us as well, are we not? Amen. Okay, and then second, it's a personal word to a discouraged man, a deeply disturbed and discouraged servant of God, just trying to follow the Lord and do the Lord's work, but he's, he's come to the end and he's having a breakdown, which shows us how very human he is, just like us. So let us look at this man and his complaint, and then how God redirects and consoles him. This is God's personal word to him. Is it also perhaps God's personal word to you? Let the Holy Spirit guide and teach. So first, at the man, God directs his word through Jeremiah, it says in verse 2. To you, O Baruch. Now, we know who he is. He's a scribe by trade, and he's Jeremiah's scribe, his secretary, which he likely is because he truly believes in the Lord, for one, and believes in Jeremiah's cause, for another. But this arrangement, this connection, this seriously limits his, op uh, his, his options and prospects for greatness, for any kind of prospects for promotion. And that's what he could otherwise have expected, except for this whole Jeremiah thing. Mm -hmm. Because maybe we don't know the fuller story about who he was and potentially could have been, because when we were first introduced to Baruch back in chapter 32, he was introduced to us in verse 12 of that chapter. Chapter 32, verse 12. As Baruch, the son of Neriah, son of Maxiah. And we might not know it otherwise or connect the dots scripturally because there's a whole lot of history and a whole lot of names to try and keep track of. But that's a pretty important family. It's possible, even that his grandfather, Maxia, if Maxia is a very spelling of his name, it's hard to know for sure, possible that he was the governor of Jerusalem under King Josiah, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 8, but one thing we know for sure, we're going to run into another son of Neriah, son of Maxia, near the end of this book. In other words... <coughs> Baruch's own brother, who's in the close service of King Zedekiah. In fact, he's in charge of the whole outfit. Flip over to chapter 51. 
verse 59. The word that Jeremiah the prophet commanded, Sariah, the son of Neriah, son of Maxhaah, when he went with Zedekiah, king of Judah, to Babylon in the fourth year of his reign, Sariah was the quartermaster, or some such translation of that very important term. See how well his brother's doing! And that's what Baruch could have been as well, or had something similar, at least I am sure, if he just hadn't chosen to side with Jeremiah. Instead of being in service to him, he could have, I'm sure, been in some great service to the king. From, from somebody prospects to nobody reality. And I'm sure he had to wrestle with all of it. Do you seek great things for yourself? God asks him in verse 5. Seek them not. But like I said, he's a nothing now, a nobody. His fortunes have been tied to Jeremiah, and Jeremiah is a pariah, a persona non grata. There's no good fortune there. That always makes Baruch a persona non grata as well. I mean, he naturally wants great things for the kingdom, but the kingdom of Judah is doomed. He's had to write it all out repeatedly and at great length, so there's no missing the message. And he naturally expects great things for himself. Why like look at his family and look, frankly, at his degree, his education, his skill. That's a high dollar sought after position being a scribe, like maybe being a lawyer today. Not many people get the opportunity or the education, and he got it all, coming as he did from what seems to be a wealthy and well-connected family, but it's all been shot to pieces because he's thrown his hat into the ring with Jeremiah. Really, and here's the offense to reckon with. He's actually thrown his hat into the ring with God. Being faithful to God and God a raw deal, so to speak. And so it might seem in the flesh, but we have to wrestle with that flesh, do we not? And what has it gotten him? Nothing but trouble. And that's his complaint. Look at verse 3. You said, woe is me, for Yahweh has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Okay, is it right to feel like that? Is it proper to say such things? And I'm sure there's nuances to that answer depending on the various parts at play, but, but one thing we know, the Lord invites us to bring everything before Him, including our complaints, our struggles, our crises of faith, or as we see it repeatedly throughout the Psalms, the book of worship for God's people, which is instructive for us because it's full of this stuff, what we typically call lament, crying out in the midst of our grief, our pain, our confusion, our trouble, expressing it, giving it voice, crying out, and here it is that we're supposed to see crying out to God. God wants us to be honest with ourselves, but not keep it to ourselves, not internalize it and let it ferment and foment and become something obsessive and controlling and faithless, but to bring it before Him in raw and honest faith. Now, was Baruch there here in these words? Or was it, at this point, simply an internalized pity party? We don't know. But either way, he's one of God's dearly loved sons. And so God comes to him with his redirecting 
and consoling words. But what brought these words about? What, what was it that he was complaining about and complaining about God? Like God's given me a raw deal, right? Well, remember the tag at the beginning about the fourth year of Jehoiakim's reign. That's when Babylon was victorious at Carchemish and the world turned. And that's when he had to write out all of these tedious, lengthy, repetitive, onerous, wrathful words of divine judgment. It's all doom, doom, doom. After Jeremiah has been preaching them for years upon years, and how long has been Baruch by his side? Long enough, it would seem. For all the doom from God and the denunciations from everyone else to sink in and take its toll. And those crushing words of judgment, not crushing not just God's people in general, but crushing any hopes for, frankly, his future as well, and he hopes for greatness, those great things. And from here, it's only going to get worse. Right? right after that, in chapter 36, taking his life into his hands to read the scroll in the temple, and then having his whole scroll scrupulously handwritten, all burned up. Now, what are we going to do? I remember the dismay I felt when I was working on my doctoral dissertation and had put hundreds of hours of tedious work into it already. And then... It crashed! Died! Like, ah! Oh, God, it was... Thankfully, so I know nothing about technology, but there are others that do. Thankfully, I was able to take it to a computer shop back then and get most of it recovered. But not for Baruch! Ah! Except that God had him write it out all over again. And then having to hide for his life from an angry king who'd already murdered a prophet before who said things he didn't want to hear, found him where he fled and hid in Egypt and brought him back just to kill him. What godless audacity. What vile spite. And will we be next? I mean, how will we possibly survive? Except that it says God hid them. Remember that? That's what made and makes the difference for his purposes. And we interacted with that back when we were there. And we need to be content, frankly, brothers and sisters, to either die or live for his purposes. And then much, much later, chapter 43, verse 3, we see Baruch getting blamed for all the judgment words, getting thrown under the bus, and, and then with Jeremiah getting dragged down to Egypt, that's chapter 43, down through verse 7, and this is where we might find ourselves as well. Perhaps you felt this way as Jeremiah has, I mean as Baruch has voiced in verse 3, perhaps, perhaps you've expressed this, perhaps you're going through something right now that is way over your head, and you just can't take it anymore. Or you're looking into the present and the future and all you see is in his words sorrow, pain, weariness, and groaning with no rest. That's okay. Take it to God. He can take it. Because you'll notice Baruch's complaint isn't squelched. It, number one, it's recorded. But it isn't squelched. Yes, it's redirected. And he's consoled, as we'll see. But God doesn't silence his complaint. He answers it. And he welcomes it, like we see so often, as I mentioned, in the Psalms of Lament. And how our Lord beckons us all in the Gospel, Matthew 11, 28, 29. Come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Rest for your souls. Like Ali had said to Jeremiah earlier in the book, Jeremiah 6.16, you will find rest for your souls. When you walk in my paths, I invite you to walk in my paths. But God does redirect his complaint. He hears Baruch's distress, and whether he was looking for it or not, or just getting it off his chest, he answers it. He sends him a very personal word, but it's a word that hits very personally to God as well. And I want to tread carefully here, because anytime we peer into the being of God, you enter difficulty. But it does hit very personally to God as well. And so God wants to inform, and by so doing, redirects him. Off of the disillusionment with being stripped of any hopes of great things. I mean, who doesn't want that? Because, as God says, everything is getting stripped, right? Look at verses 4 and first part of 5. Thus shall you say to him, thus says Yahweh, behold, what I have built, I am breaking down. And what I have planted, I am plucking up. That is the whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. For, for behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares Yahweh. Here we're brought into God's personal experience with Judah, his own special people, and how he feels about it. You think you've got it bad. You think you're experiencing sorrow and pain. I am crushing my own people. It's like how he had to redirect Jeremiah himself back in chapter 12, verse 5. He said there, if you have raced with men on foot, and they have wearied you, speaking there specifically of his own family's threats against his life, it's only going to get worse. He continues, how will you compete with horses? Come on. Come on. So here he speaks to Baruch in all his sorrow and pain and basically says, you want to talk about sorrow and pain. See what I am having to do. Not to dismiss Baruch's words at all, but to, but to redirect them. To put them into perspective with what God himself feels. And we are brought here to gain a glimpse, even though we can't even begin to fathom the mind and emotions of God. And yes, he is absolutely sovereign. And as it says in Ephesians 1.11, works all things according to the counsel of his will. But he also... Feels. And by the way, the expression here that what I have built up, I am breaking down, and what I have planted, I am plucking up. These are terms that we have heard over and over. They've been used repeatedly throughout Jeremiah, going all the way back to his commission in chapter 1, verse 10, but also as recently as chapter 42, verse 10, where God had extended, if you remain in this land, then I will build you up and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. And, and then here's another emotion type of word. He says, for I relent of the disaster that I did to you, and they did not heed yet again. It's similar, it would seem, to how Jesus laments about Jerusalem in Luke chapter 13, where he said in verse 34, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing? Mm -hmm. And then later how he weeps over it as he approaches Jerusalem, entering as the promised Messiah, yes, but to bear the cross and to give them over to the judgment of desolation. That's Luke 19, verses 41 to 44. Again, we can't begin to fathom, but we're given a glimpse into it, a, a window into his soul, so to speak. If we feel the negativity of it all, and we do, how much more does he, even as he judges and must judge, we see that most poignantly in the cross. 
And then again, um, addressing his understandable but fleshly disillusionment. You seek great things. Don't seek them. I've got different plans. Be content with these different things. Be content with smaller things. Reminds me of a devotional that an older couple, couple in my former church gave to me as an encouragement which I've had tacked to my wall in my office ever since. I know if any of you come to my office, there is this tack board that's way too crowded. <laughs> but one thing has been there from the beginning. It's titled, uh, Small is Beautiful, from John, the tail end of John chapter six. And it's got a personal note from Joan. Saw this devotional several weeks ago and thought this might bless your heart. Okay, I wanna read it to you. Because it did for me at that moment then and every day since. And let it bless your heart as well. Just the other day, someone said of a friend, this man is destined for a great ministry. By which he meant he was headed for the big time. A high profile church with a big budget. Made me wonder, why do we think that God's call is necessarily upwardly mobile? <laughs> why, friend? Why wouldn't he send his best workers to labor for a lifetime in some small place? Aren't there people in obscure places who need to be evangelized and taught? God is not willing that any perish. Jesus cared about the individual as well as the masses. He taught large crowds if they appeared, but it never bothered him that his audience grew smaller every day. Many left him, John said, John 6, verse 66, a fickle attrition that would have thrown most of us into a high panic. Yet Jesus pressed on with those the Father gave him. Mm -hmm. We live in a culture where bigger is better, where size is the measure of success. It takes a strong person to resist that trend, especially if he or she is laboring in a small place. Mm -hmm. But size is nothing. Substance is everything. Whether you're pastoring a small church or leading a small Bible study or Sunday school class, serve them with all your heart. Pray, love, teach by word and example. Your little place is not a stepping stone to greatness. It is greatness. Come on. Come on. So, John and Joan Holmes, just an elderly Dutch couple. If you thought German was guttural, Listen to Dutch. <laughs> I, 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 it was quite an education. Uh, that's an aside. <laughs> William Carey. I remember reading his biography when I was young. Fabulous man of God. Groundbreaking ministry, missionary to India back in the day. In the boldness of faith, he declared, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And he did and God did through him. Praise the Lord. But sometimes it's also be content with small things for God or different things. As God says to us in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares Yahweh. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts, then your thoughts. So whatever we do, to do it faithfully and to do it for God. God doesn't measure the amount. God measures the faithfulness. Look at the widow's might, as it's been called from the King James. She put in more than everyone else, Jesus said. Luke chapter 21, I'll just want to read those verses for you. This is the beginning of Luke chapter 21. Jesus looked up and saw the rich putting their gifts into the offering box, and he saw a poor widow put in two small copper coins. And he said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all of them. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty put in all she had to live on. That's God's way of doing math. Or look at the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. We've, we touched on that before, but it's the same well done, good and faithful servant. Verse 21 and verse 23, 
whether to the one who was faithful with five talents or the one who was faithful with only two. It wasn't the measure. It was the faithfulness. Or as Jesus goes on to say in both of those aforementioned verses, I want to just read them for you, Matthew 25, 21. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. Okay, verse 23. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. We're working here for his well done day. And faithfulness here of whatever size and scope and impact, the way we tend to measure things, is greatly rewarded there. The joy of your master. We can't even begin to grasp it. Or as Jesus says in Luke chapter 9, verses 46 to 48, An argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest. That's what we like, isn't it? If you're seeking great things, don't seek those. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by his side and said to them, Whoever receives this child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all is the one who is great. God turns things on their heads. And then after that, must have been uncomfortable redirection. God issues him this consolation. Every word is personal, and so is this one. Let's finish out verse 5. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. All places. Doesn't matter where. All places, even the scary ones, even the dark ones, and he had them a plenty. All places, even into and through this coming desolation, talk about scary and dark. All places, even to Egypt, which is where we left off in chapter 44, which is the end of the road for both Jeremiah and Baruch, and with Baruch as the bad guy. But God would be with him even there, which is another reason why God, in his wisdom, arranged this chapter here. The consolation is this gift, the best gift of all. When it all boils down to nothing, and you are stripped, of everything, what is the one thing that you want most of all? When the gun's to your head, right, and they want to take all your money or your car or whatever, what's the one thing you plead for? Your life, right. Take everything. You can have it all. Just don't shoot me. And here God says, I'm going to give you that. No matter what the jeopardy, no matter what the threat, I will let you escape scot-free with your life as booty or plunder. That's the word rendered prize of war in my version is. Like a, like a warrior, it's going to be so good. Like a warrior rushing to the spoils. That's the rush of this gift. It is consolation. And this very personal consolation is what we earlier heard issued to another simple but faithful servant of God, acting faithful in the midst of his fears. Remember Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian eunuch, who rescued Jeremiah from a slow and certain and terrifying in that slow certainty. Think about it. Go back there and think about being stuck in the muck at the bottom of that cistern. Death. God said to him, likewise, and similar to what he says to Baruch here, he says, 39, 18, you shall have your life as a prize of war because you have put your trust in me. So will we put our trust in him? 
in the midst of all these howling storms. That's what we are invited to here. I mean, our consolation might not be the same as here, but we have the greatest consolation of all of his presence and his peace. As Jesus said to his disciples, and we are included, John 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Again, in John 16, 33, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Indeed he has. We see it. There. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Your word that speaks directly into our hearts as well. Even as you have given your word to your dear distressed and discouraged servant back then, when the world seemed like it had all turned in the wrong way, so you are speaking that word to us as well. Help us to truly take that word to heart and, and look to your peace that you promised to us and look to the cross that you have given to us even as we enter and walk through those storms hand in hand with the maker of heaven. Please turn with me now to hymn 543. We're going to sing, Till the Storm Passes By, Please Stand. In the dark of the midnight 
Even as we sometimes have to voice it timidly, the Lord will give his strength to us, and he will bless us with his peace. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May Yahweh lift up his face upon you and give you peace both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us. Please join us for some fellowship and refreshment. You mentioned I went nowhere because they had a they had a huge breakdown. I can think of how I got up.